Hello and welcome to the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on September 15th, 2022 from South Carolina Public Radio Studios here in Columbia. Just so you know, some of the information in this podcast may have changed by the time you've heard it. Now, since we're on Honeymoon Week here on The Lead, we wanted to bring you an extended conversation that I had with outgoing Superintendent of Education, Molly Spearman. We taped this on August 30th for This Week in South Carolina, and I knew that my listeners would love to hear it too, in case you didn't watch it. Now, Spearman is a former music teacher of 18 years. She represented House District 39 in the State House for eight years, and she has served as the head of South Carolina schools since January 2015. She announced last year that she would not run for re-election this November. But we wanted to catch up with her as the school year began and hear her plans for teacher recruitment and retention, how to improve school conditions and lagging test scores, and keep students safe, among other top issues that she's dealt with and her soon-to-be elected successor will also deal with. Take a listen. This is your last year as superintendent of education. We'll get to that in a minute. But I just want to ask you how schools are doing right now COVID-19 has kind of gotten to an endemic phase almost. What's it like? Are we back to normal? Well, so far, so good. Uh, I was over in my hometown of Saluda with school opening and huge excitement. People are just so happy to uh, to be back. Um, football season's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, kids are, the kids are excited. Families are certainly excited to have the children back in school. So I think that we're at a point where schools will be able to manage COVID at the local level to make the choices that they need to make and a responsibility for families. You know, if your child's sick, stay home. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be moving on just as normal. And vaccines became more and more available for school-age students, children. Uh, Is that ever going to get to a point where we're going to have required immunizations? I don't think so. I I really don't think that we'll do that. Of course, we have the normal vaccine requirements for students uh, that that have been there for years, and those will stay in place. But I I see no move to a requirement on the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. And there's no mask requirements either? No No mask requirements. Uh, Students even, uh, you know, are not required to quarantine. There's no contact tracing going on. Obviously, if you're sick, running a fever, you need to stay home. But other than that, uh, it should be a pretty normal year. It's good to hear, yeah. <laughs> especially after the past two years. But, Superintendent, when we look at the past two years, we talk about lessons learned. A lot of things changed. It was a, a lot of growing pains, obviously. Yeah. Uh, what were some of those big lessons, some big takeaways that you guys proudly look at? Maybe, obviously, you, you work through, but maybe some that have been applied going forward. Well, I think the number one thing that we've that we knew, but this has certainly confirmed it, is that students, uh, almost all students, particularly those who are struggling, need to be in school Mm -hmm. with a teacher, working with them one-on-one, face-to-face. So uh, having children in school is so important. I think the whole community and state world now realizes that the public school system is so intertwined into all facets of our life. So when schools closed, businesses suffered. So we have to work together. And that's why it's so important for us to keep our schools going, not just for the learning, but for that whole community involvement that we have. Um, It caused us to work more closely together. Mm -hmm. One of the great successes has been our broadband expansion that bringing access to students all over South Carolina, where previously it was difficult to get people to come to the table. There was some turf battles going on Mm -hmm. between the providers, but that all has been washed away. The other thing that has really helped us is is the federal relief funding that came down. Uh, We were able to provide the cleaning, the supplies that all the schools need, but beyond that, we've been able to hire tutors, Uh, One of the things that we've done at the agency is to put a lot of our funding into an instruction hub, which will be available. It's available this year now for Mm -hmm. all teachers, every teacher, whether they're in the largest district or the smallest district, to access high quality instructional materials. And that has been a wish for many years, and it was through the federal funding that we were able to do that. And I could go on and Mm -hmm. on about all the things that have happened, but I think we're all more focused, laser focused, and are learning a lot and implementing a lot about accelerated learning. How do you bring those students who struggle? How do we really make that happen even faster that they regain and are exposed to more learning within one school year? Mm -hmm. And a big finding that I just heard of from this report, this COVID 
debrief basically from the South Carolina Institute of Medicine and Public Health. They found that schools should not close in the right. future should there be another outbreak like that. So it's kind of what right. you're talking about right. there, finding that hybrid infrastructure when it needs to be. Yes, yes. And, you know, looking back on it, uh, sh should we have closed that Sunday afternoon? <laughs> uh, I would say probably not. Uh, but at the time, we did not know. And there was public outcry for us to close. Mm -hmm. why, why was it taking us so long? So we've learned, we've learned a lot. And I appreciate the patience of the parents and communities because uh, I hope they understand that while we were doing the very best we could do at the time with the knowledge, we were relying on health experts to help us through that. And we did try to keep the well-being of the student at the, at the height of the decisions that were made. Going back now, we probably would have reacted a little differently, but those are lessons learned. Yeah, I mean, it was a global pandemic. It I mean, was. we had never seen something like that. That's and, right. But looking at that, Superintendent, how are children performing right now? What are the assessments looking like? The end of the year assessment, perhaps, that mm -hmm. they just had done? Well, it's not good, uh, but I will say this. Generally speaking, the students who were A and B students did okay. Mm -hmm. And they were able to carry on, whether they were in school or at home virtually, they had the support that they needed. Our C students and below are the ones who really struggled. And we are beginning now with midterm assessments to see that they are making gains, mm -hmm. not as fast as we need them to do, but uh, we are laser focused on that. I would say our, our lower performing students, while some of them were already a half a year to a year behind, add another four to five months behind for them. So it is uh, alarming, uh, it's not shocking, but it is something that we have to focus on. And I think it's more time on task and it's more uh, high quality expectations for these students and really figuring out what are the priority standards that they have to learn. Mm -hmm. Can't teach everything, but we have to laser focus in on what are those priority standards in mathematics reading that they have to have. Yeah, because that's been a big focus, of course, since last year, too, when you started seeing those those students really falling behind. So how are you, I mean, have we made accomplishments? It sounds like it's still kind of Yes, we're seeing in, in the mid in the mid uh, term assessments and the end of year assessments, we are beginning to see some gains, mm -hmm. uh, but but we they have not caught back up to the level where they need to be. Mm -hmm. So they're well identified. Teachers at the school know exactly where those students are. And they are, they have hired extra tutors, uh, they're giving extra time on tasks, smaller groups, mm -hmm. whatever method that school can accomplish, they're doing that with those students now. And we need parents to help us at home, uh, and we need uh, the after school programs, which we have funded many of those, to really be high quality to make use of every minute we have with the student. Superintendent, does that tie into that federal money you're talking about too in terms yes, of getting the yes. targeted resources for yes, these kids? Yes, and we have three pots of those, that funding. Uh, one pot had to be spent by this September, mm -hmm. uh, next the year 23, and then the final uh, money has to be spent by September of 24. So you will see this support going on for the next two years. And are you seeing some innovative initiatives, I guess, from some of these school districts with this federal money in terms of you know, either catching kids up or implementing new technology. I mean, I know you were talking about that, that centralized instructional database, essentially, but mm -hmm. are we seeing some novel uh, changes when it comes to well, instruction? Well, I think uh, more and more technology being used, the access where students, we have uh, tutoring available 24-7 through a program that the state is paying for called tutor.com. Mm -hmm. Any child can access that uh, with a live person assisting them tw 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So technology is helping us be able to deliver the, the support that the students need. When we look at not just federal funding, but state funding, you guys had a pretty big year. The budget was massive this past year. <laughs> we had a, a lot of uh, you know growth in the budget. We had a lot of one-time dollars, which can go to a lot of capital investments and the like. Tell us about the, the It was a there. big year, and the one I'm most proud, well, the two things that I'm really, <laughs> really proud of that were in the budget this year. When I started, uh, Gavin, in 2015, the starting pay for teachers that the state sent to the districts. Now, most districts supplement this, but the starting pay for first-year teachers was $29,500. 
This year it's forty thousand dollars. That's a thirty-five percent increase in eight years. I think that's phenomenal, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate the General Assembly being devoted to that and working with me on that. Uh, the other thing that I am so proud of, I have been crying for out to for support for the rural districts in their facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, in South Carolina, building schools, keeping up your buildings, all falls to the local. There used to be a little money, and there was a bond bill back 20 some odd years ago, but we have not given state support for that. And when a mill of tax in Charleston is over $2 million and a mill of tax in Allendale is $20,000, to do any kind of yeah. school renovation or build a new building is just not even in the in their dreams that they could do that. So the legislature came through last year and again this year with facility funding, $140 million both mm -hmm. years going to the poorest and the neediest districts in the state. And they gave the me as state superintendent the responsibility to decide who the, to come up with the formula, which we did. And we have been allocating that funding. And first uh, was Lee County. Mm -hmm. And you may have reported that, you know, over in Lee, they have three elementary schools, one building, one side the roof fell in. And they had to move children to the other side. So they're getting around $42 million now to build a new elementary school. They'll mm -hmm. consolidate all three schools into one. Could never have done that without state support. That's happening in Clarendon and all over the state, in Saluda, Abbeville, Hampton. Uh, and other announcements that will be coming. To, so it's a dream of mine, and I think it really goes back to the Abbeville lawsuit, mm -hmm. uh, that we are really helping those districts who cannot help themselves, who have really good, clean buildings, but they're just old and do not meet the safety and technology needs of today. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we know that you know, it, it's not just a building that makes an education, but do you think it's gonna make a big difference in terms of how these children learn? Well, all you have to do is walk through. Okay, um, I think some folks need to get off the interstate <laughs> and drive through the other part of South Carolina and really see it and feel it. When you see the beautiful buildings that we have in some areas of the state, you see that pride in education. And that's what the teachers feel, the students feel, the community feels. And then you go into an old dilapidated building where it's clean, uh, and yes, you can learn there. But there's something about the pride in having something fresh and new to show the commitment that we have to education for every student in South Carolina, no matter where they live. Mm -hmm. And then also this change up of how the funding is going to, is that something that was a long yeah, time coming as well? Well, the new formula, yes. Uh, we've all talked about it. I know throughout my career, we've worked on this to try to come up with something that would be easier to understand and very fair to everyone. The new formula uh, is in place. It, mm -hmm. it, it is streamlined. It is based on a student-teacher ratio. We're learning and working out all the glitches now to, th that we're in the first year of implementation, so I think it's gonna be a really good thing uh, and will help move us forward. It gives more responsibility to the local districts, gives mm -hmm. them more flexibility, which they've been asking for for a long time. So now we need to see how they're gonna handle it. And uh, it's gonna take them being very dedicated to keep students first, teachers to support their teachers as they should. Mm -hmm. Superintendent, just to go back to teacher pay raises, going to that $40,000 level, and of course step increases too for current teachers. Uh, what more needs to be done to retain them? Obviously that's been a big issue. And, and what's the current vacancy situation looking like yeah. in South Carolina schools yeah. right now? Well, you're absolutely right. And we've done a lot too over the last eight years. I've been in office working with the General Assembly that we've added steps to the, to the salary ladder so that teachers will continue to get an increase. We've also had 2%, 3%, I think about 7 or 8% total uh, over the last few years to the entire salary schedule. So it is, uh, money is important. Uh, when a teacher can leave the classroom and go work at a fast food restaurant mm -hmm. <laughs> and make more. Now, I think most teachers realize that 
it is not just about the money, mm -hmm. and but they do need to make a fair living for their families. So it's about the impact that they make. So we'll continue even as we're preparing, and even though I won't be at the General Assembly in January when they come back to work, I do have to submit a budget to them. Mm -hmm. And we're asking again for another uh, increase. It's a little different now. It won't be just a percentage increase in the new formula, but we're asking for $75 million to be put into the new budget toward teacher salaries. And I've, I've spoken with the leaders, some of the leaders already, and I know they're interested in doing that. I can't say what the exact amount will be, mm -hmm. but I know that they're committed to continually. We can't, it's not just a one-year thing because North Carolina, Georgia, the other states are working on it too. And we want to be at the top of the Southeast and really at the national average. So we've got a little work to keep doing. Especially in this job market too, you have to compete to keep them. So right. But, so right. Uh, Superintendent, what's it looking like right now in terms of vacancies in the state? And well, how do you, how do you mitigate that? How well, do you deal we're, with that? we're still we're still waiting to get the exact numbers on, on how many. There are districts who have everything filled. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who are still looking for folks, uh, having to be uh, creative in how they staff their school. Uh, I don't have the exact number yet, but I'm sure there'll be several hundred mm -hmm. uh, vacancies uh, that, that are there. And we have to remember South Carolina is a growing state, uh, more students coming. Our charter movement is growing, but mm -hmm. that means there's, those are teacher positions too that, that have to be filled. So it's a huge requirement. And with the job market as it is right now nationally and in South Carolina, uh, people have their pick mm -hmm. where they wanna go work. And so it, it, whenever we have low unemployment like we do now, uh, there's always an issue with teachers, teacher shortages. So we've got to continue to show support. I think that's the main thing, that teachers just want to know that we, now more than ever, that we appreciate them, mm -hmm. we care for them, and we're listening to them, giving them opportunities to be involved in leadership decisions at the school and doing helping them uh, unencumbered time. That yeah, was a, a bill that, that passed this year. I mean, it's so true. They need a break mm -hmm. during the day. Now, many of them do get a break, but there still are some who do not get a break. And this new law that goes into effect next year, uh, that has to happen. At least 30 minutes, I believe, is the number that mm -hmm. says that they have to have of unencumbered time. So just things like that that seem so little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's a matter would, of being heard, essentially. It's a matter of being heard, and showing that type of support in a district at the local level and state level means the world to our teachers. Mm -hmm. But when we switch from, you know, from that aspect of schools to safety, you know, we saw that horrible shooting in Texas at Uvalde. Mm -hmm. Are our schools safe? Do you know if we would ever face a similar situation where police, I don't know if you've talked to police in the state, if they would ever wait in a situation like that or would they go right in and handle it? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I will say that our schools are prepared for that horrible thing. They, they do drills, they, they have hardened, we've given money to harden the entrances, to do the things. In fact, school safety, we're just announcing, I, I approved a memo to go out to districts uh, this week of safety training that'll be go, that will be going on September and October, mm -hmm. constantly learning from horrible mistakes like those in Uvalde to do better. Now, when that did happen, I asked that question because we have a few larger school districts that do have their own security force. What would happen? And for instance, up in Greenville, I asked, that would not ever happen in South Carolina, this confusion about who's in charge. But even though a local district might have their own security force, the the entity, the county or the city that the school is located in automatically is in charge. So uh, I'm happy that we, that part has already been Clear worked out. Clear chain of command. Yeah, and I, I'm just really impressed with uh, our folks over at SLED, our district safety leaders. We have organized even more over the last few years. We have a round table group now of safety directors and folks who come in quarterly during the year to meet, to always be up, upgrading. This past summer, we reviewed our safety checklist plans. Schools are reviewed their plans. Those are coming in to us now for review. So it's a continuation. We continue to learn the new equipment, new technology comes out. But I, I just have real strong confidence in Chief Kill mm -hmm. at SLED and our district safety directors that they are well prepared. Um, human beings still make mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, you can't ever say 100%, <laughs> but I will tell you that we're as prepared, I believe, as we can be. And of course, we've seen more SRO funding as well, the too. SRO, but that's right. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, the governor has taken that as one of his uh, agenda items. And yes, the, there's, there's sufficient funding there to hire. Mm -hmm. The problem is finding the people. Mm -hmm. Just there's a shortage in law enforcement as well. So uh, some districts work with private security firms, uh, tr however they can man their schools. But uh, the funding is there mm -hmm. to do all. Uh, for that support. As well as mental health counselors too. We know that's another side of this coin, but that's yeah. also a difficult challenge to get. It really is. Uh, and again, I'll give hats off uh, to Governor McMaster because he called for uh, and appointed Robbie Kerr mm -hmm. uh, over the ending of the last school year to look at our delivery of mental health services across the state in schools. We met with the school superintendents to get their ideas and now more authority, more money is the number one thing because we were not paying these mental health counselors enough. Uh, their, the reimbursement rate uh, has been increased so schools can get and hire better people and more authority at the local level for them to hire. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to take a while for that. That transition is happening now, uh, but I think it will mean better and more services available to students at the local level. Superintendent, we have five minutes left. Oh. We've already talked about so much, but we have so much more to talk about, including another bill that got passed, a controversial bill that got passed this past year, uh, the Save Women's Sports yes. Act, you know, with transgender uh, girls playing on sports teams up through high yeah. school. Uh, was this law necessary in your opinion? There were, there were already procedures in place to kind of yeah. handle these issues. Uh, do you think it accomplishes anything? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I spoke out on this issue, and let me be clear, I think it is an issue that we have to look at very carefully because we don't want one student to have a physical advantage, an unfair physical advantage over another student. Mm -hmm. So um, my position on it though, however, was uh, we only had a, a few students, transgender students, to apply. Uh, the South Carolina High School League had put in place a plan to review that with a medical team to decide, does this student, is this something that's just happening now where you, there really definitely is an unfair advantage or is this something that happened long ago and, and probably most folks didn't even realize the child was transgender. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like it needed to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis rather than just one legislative uh, uh, issue that or a rule that everybody had to follow under. So um, I could have lived with it the way it is. Uh, I think we're working now and we'll just have to see how it plays out. Uh, another controversial bill that was discussed but did not pass dealt with critical race theory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an issue that's taught in South Carolina schools, K-12 through schools, but it consumed a lot of time. There was big yeah. hearings on it. Can you tell us about that? Uh, do lawmakers need to get involved in this <laughs> curriculum down to this level? Well, I th they, they believe that they do. I testified again that I think it's uh, we, we don't teach it. Uh, we don't want ideologies to play into effect in our classrooms of the state. We have to be very, very careful, and we have to make sure teachers understand what they should say, not say. Mm -hmm. We want to teach the truth. We want the good and the bad of mm -hmm. history or whatever it may be, uh, but we certainly don't want to make any child feel guilty or that they were responsible. And I, th I think that's, that's where this issue comes into play. So I have testified over and over, these critical race theory is not taught in our standards. Uh, it won't be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are reviewing our textbooks and materials more closely than ever. Uh, so I, I think our local schools can handle it and we can handle it through guidance, but our teachers definitely need some guidance now because they're very confused and, about what they can and cannot say. Mm -hmm. So if that takes some legislation to help with that, I, I can support that, but I do think it's our responsibility and we are working on that guidance right now. A divisive issue that we saw across the country, but also we're seeing more and more divisive uh, moments at school board meetings yeah. too. And there was a non-binding question on the June primary ballot for the Republican Republican ballot asking if that we should have partisan elections at school boards. Do you think that we should be doing that? No, I do not. Okay. I do not. And I think we need to come together, not only just around education, but on other issues. The partisanship has not brought us better policy. Uh, and I think folks need to calm down often. I think we all choose our TV stations that we like to watch because they say things that we 
agree with, but we need to realize that, look, our educators are dedicated folks. They're doing this because they love kids. And we need to get back to that supporting and a trust with them rather than questioning everything. Um, so the incivility, I, I'm very concerned about. Mm -hmm. I, I think in our schools, we really do need to be helping our students learn to love each other, respect each other, value each other, and listen and realize that, yeah, we may not disagree on things, but we can do it in a civil way. So I think that's a part of our responsibility at school to help prepare future citizens of our state. Superintendent, we barely have a minute left. I want to ask you to wrap up your legacy in about 30 <laughs> seconds. You were a school teacher, you were in the state house, you were superintendent for two terms. What do you see your legacy being, especially in the era I of COVID? Hope, I hope it, people will look to see that Molly Spearman added value to the lives of students and families in South Carolina and that maybe I did a little something to make our state a better place. It has been a joy to serve, and uh, it's sadness that I leave, but I feel I'm very much at peace about, I know that I've done the best job that I could do, always focusing on what's best for students and families in our state. Very good, it's great to have you back on set, thank Superintendent you. Molly Spearman, thank you so much. Thank you, Gavin. Like everything we do here at ETV, you can find that video and more at youtube.com slash South Carolina ETV. You can even find this podcast there too, folks. And again, thanks for listening to the pod. We love hearing from you guys. So give us a call. Give us a shout. Let us know what you think about schools in South Carolina. 803-563-7169. You just heard from Superintendent Spearman. Let us know your thoughts. And you can stay up to date with the latest news on scetv.org and southcarolinapublicradio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. You all, South Carolina. Hello and welcome to the South Carolina lead. Did you like that? <laughs> all right, you got the rest? You have all the letters I've said. B, 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 C, C, C. <laughs>